First, there's the issue of the bored Guth Vilenkin theorem. I'll let the documentary summarize it and then show Craig's response to that in a debate with Peter Milliken. This, you know what? This is gonna this is gonna be an interesting one. Because the Borda Guth Vilenkin theorem is is certainly one that is oftentimes not um not properly represented. And the, the, the clip that we're going to see here is, is also, is also something I, I find that th there is a quote in it from um, Alan Guth, one of the authors. And I, I find it very interesting. There's also one from Alexander Belenk, and I don't know if it's in the, the clip that we're going to see here, but I know, I, I know that it is in the, uh, in Skydive Phil's actual documentary. physics community abandoning its belief in the applicability of the penrose hawking theorem, Kalam advocates switched to a newer theorem, known as the Bordek, Guth, and Vilenkin theorem, or BGV. This theorem was developed because the period of rapid expansion, known as inflation, that's believed to have taken place in the early universe, violates one of the assumptions of the penrose hawking theorem, that gravity is always attractive. Inflation is also thought to be eternal into the future, creating an infinite multiverse. In 2003, Arvind Bord, Alan Guth, and Alexander Vilenkin were able to prove that any universe, which is on average in a state of cosmic expansion throughout its history, cannot be infinite in the past, but must have a past space-time boundary. What makes their proof so powerful is that it holds time by infinite in the past, cosmic expansion that any universe, which is on average in a state of cosmic expansion throughout its history, cannot be infinite in the past, but must have a past space-time boundary. Now, see, this is where it's not necessarily inaccurate what he's saying a professional or somebody who's very familiar with the literature would would probably understand what he's saying but a lay person is not what the, they're going to take what he said is that any universe that looks like ours must have a boundary at which it begins past which it cannot be extended but that is not technically what the borde guth vilenkin theorem states what the borde guth vilenkin theorem states is that any universe which is expanding on the average cannot have its expansion or its inflationary state extended indefinitely into the past. Whether or not the space-time could be extended indefinitely into the past in some non-inflationary manner remains to be seen, but if that is the case, it isn't an inflationary space-time. The expansion of space-time cannot be extended indefinitely into the past. But whether or not space-time as a structure could exist for an indefinite amount of time is, is not at all even addressed by the borde guth vilenkin theorem. And it, it should also be mentioned that the borde guth vilenkin theorem, the, the, the BGV theorem, was not was not actually that profound. It didn't give us anything that cosmologists didn't already pretty much practically assume. Not only that, it doesn't actually make any statements about the origin of the universe. All it states is that an inflationary space-time cannot have its inflationary period extended indefinitely into the past. It makes no statements whatsoever, and I want to reiterate and make this clear. It makes no statements about whether the space-time in some non-inflationary state could be extended indefinitely into the past. There are certainly viable models in which that's the case. And a lot of cosmologists, I won't say most, but a lot of cosmologists would say that it, that may very well be the case. We really just don't know yet. So I, I don't want to say that, that, that Dr. Craig is being dishonest here because I mean, what he said is, I think, fairly accurate. But I do want to point out that there is, there is a sense in which it could be seen as potentially misleading, particularly to a lay audience. And I think it's important to specify what specifically the BGV theorem is saying so that people understand that in all actuality, it doesn't make any statements about the origin of the universe. It makes statements about the structure of an inflationary space-time and what you can do with that in terms of extending it into the future or into the past. 
and I'm assuming that this this is also the face that Dr. Craig would actually make if if he would was hearing what I was <laughs> what I was saying. Anyway. What makes their proof so powerful is that it holds regardless of the physical description of the very early universe. So in fact, the Bord Guth Vilenkin theorem does imply an absolute beginning of the universe. I was working with Arvin Borda and Alex Vilenkin to understand okay, though. Hold on here. Hold on here. Regardless of the makes their proof so powerful is that it holds regardless of the physical description of the very early universe. So in fact, the Bord Guth Vilenkin theorem does imply an absolute beginning of the universe. No. <clears throat> it is true that the BGV theorem holds independently of any particular description of the universe. But all that means is that any description of the universe prior to that boundary must be non-inflationary. Not that there can only be an absolute beginning. The theorem does not prove it, it in any way that the, the, the universe has an absolute beginning. It does not address the origin of the universe. It is more a statement about the structure of an inflationary space-time. You can't extend it indefinitely. You can't extend the inflationary period or the expanding phase of that space-time indefinitely into the past. But again, and I want to make this point very clear, that isn't a statement about the space-time itself. You can extend it indefinitely into the past if it has non, if it has a non-inflationary structure, and there are viable models which do that, whether or not they will serve to be correct. We don't know. I was working with Arvind Borda and Alex Valenkin to understand uh, what we can learn about how inflation might have started and how far back it could have gone. And in particular, once we realized that inflation could be eternal into the future, it seemed like a very natural question to ask, could inflation have also been eternal into the past? Uh, and what we found was that inflation could not be eternal into the past. Uh, what we basically managed to achieve was proving a theorem uh, which says that the uh, any expanding region of space-time uh, that has a minimum expansion rate uh, can only go back so far and not infinitely far. Uh, so that means that inflation must have had a beginning. It doesn't really say that the universe must have had a beginning. Uh, I just want to clarify for everybody, this is one of the authors of the theorem, and the theorem ultimately is a theorem relating to the inflationary epoch. This is also the man, this is this is Dr. Alan Guth, this is the man who single-handedly pioneered inflationary cosmology. So, and he's again one of the authors of this theorem, and, and listen to what he just said. Let's let, let let's have a re-listen because I want this point to be made explicitly clear. Inflation must have had a beginning. It doesn't really say that the universe must have had a beginning. Uh, must have had a beginning far and not infinitely far. Uh, so that means that inflation must have had a beginning. It doesn't really say that the universe must have had a beginning. Inflation must have had a beginning. It doesn't really say that the universe must have had a beginning. That means that inflation must have had a beginning. It doesn't really say that the universe must have had a beginning. Uh, I, I hope everybody got that. I really do hope that everybody got that. But it says that the universe could not have been expanding forever uh, up until the present time. The theorem proves that inflation must have a beginning, right? Uh, the, the universe uh, as a whole, um, it doesn't, the theorem doesn't say that. It says that the uh, Expansion of the universe must have a beginning. And I argued first that the universe began to exist. And he, here he says, well, but look, there are different multiverse scenarios, various models of the universe. I talked about those in my opening speech and explained that the bohr guth vilenkin theorem applies to those and shows a beginning of the universe. No, it would show a beginning to the expanding or the inflating phase or region of space-time, but not necessarily a beginning to the space-time. And then he says, but uh, Vilenkin says that you can avoid the uh, bohr guth vilenkin theorem by positing a contraction prior to this one. Now, this is a statement from a letter of Vilenkin to Victor Stenger, which is very often quoted out of context by atheists. Let me read you the full context. Vilenkin says, 
you can evade the theorem by postulating that the universe was contracting prior to some time. This sounds as if there is nothing wrong with having a contraction prior to expansion. But the problem is that a contracting universe is highly unstable. Small perturbations would cause it to develop all sorts of messy singularities, so it would never make it to the expanding phase. So he says, if someone asks me whether or not the theorem I proved with Bord and Groove implies that the universe had a beginning, I would say that the short answer is yes. If you are willing to get into subtleties, then the answer is no, but. That is to say, you've got the problem with the messy singularities that prevent re-expansion. I do want to... So the, the thing here is that what Vilenkin is explaining is that you can, the BGV theorem doesn't prove that the universe has a beginning, but at most of the models which try to extend the universe indefinitely into the past fail, but ultimately they fail for reasons that don't really relate to the theorem, they relate to other issues with um, considering those assumptions and those physical models in reality, such as like Dr. Craig outlined correctly, the, the messy singularities. So the, the, the problem here is that, this is why Vilenkin said, if, if you're willing to get into the technicalities, does the theorem prove that the universe had a beginning? No, but the models which try to extend it you know, indefinitely into the past fail, and they fail for reasons that are ultimately unrelated to the BGV theorem. So this is the thing. The BGV theorem doesn't prove that space-time or the universe has a beginning. It shows that any expanding or inflating region with, with some minimum expansion rate cannot, that, that region of space-time, that phase cannot be extended indefinitely into the past. And then Vilenkin goes on to say, however, Aside from that, there are other reasons unrelated to the theorem for why models that do attempt to extend space-time indefinitely into the past uh, ultimately um, fail. And with with regard to the um, to the quote, the very first part. Uh, so so the, the, what Mr. Stenger asks verbatim to Mr. Vilenkin is, does your theorem prove that the universe must have had a beginning? And Vilenkin replies, no but it proves that the expansion of the universe must have had a beginning. You can evade the theorem by postulating that the universe was contracting prior to some time. At which point then Vilenkin goes on to show that, but those models fail for reasons unrelated to the theorem. And Vilenkin, I don't believe, personally thinks that the universe has extended indefinitely in the past. So again, just trying to provide some more um, clarification and uh, clarity with, re with respect to that. I want to add here that to the documentary's credit, they do offer a reply to this objection from Craig, though it's a somewhat speculative reply about this aspect of cosmology and astrophysics. Uh, and then Craig, of course, has other things to say about that kind of reply in the Blackwell Companion to Natural Theology. So these replies that Craig makes, they're interesting and they should be judged on their own merits. But as I said, I now think we should see scientific evidence for the beginning of the past this is something just before the the, the the BGV theorem point here wraps up. There is one thing I want to do for you guys really, really quickly. And that is share with you a very interesting, something that's very interesting. Now this is, I'm going to make this full screen here. Well, actually, if it doesn't make it any bigger, I won't. Um, this is the paper initially authored by Arvind Borda, Alan Guth, and Alexander Vilenkin. Now, the important part is actually towards the end, because you have to actually read the paper, and I have read the whole paper many, many times. But right here is a very important statement. And I'm going to read the whole thing, because th 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 this, this is just, th this makes the point. So this comes after they kind of explain how, um, you know, any, any geodesic in a, in a space time, an inflationary space time with some minimum expansion rate will, they, they will, will converge on a boundary at some point in the past. You cannot extend so, uh, space time with some minimum expansion rate. You cannot extend that expanding phase indefinitely into the past. And you, 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 will, get, you will get to a boundary. All the geodesics will converge on a boundary. And so here they say... What can lie beyond this boundary? Several possibilities have been discussed. 
one being that the boundary of the inflating region corresponds to the beginning of the universe in a quantum nucleation event. I think that's something along the lines of what uh, Dr. Valenkin personally believes, but don't quote me on that. The boundary is then a closed space-like hypersurface, which can be determined from the appropriate instanton. Whatever the possibilities for the boundary, it is clear that unless the average expansion condition can somehow be avoided for all past directed geodesics, inflation alone is not sufficient to provide a complete description of the universe, and some new physics is necessary in order to determine the correct conditions at the boundary. End quote. So they're they're essentially saying that you can go beyond the boundary, but you know, we're going to need some sort of new physics in order to do that. We don't currently have that physics. And whether that physics itself um, extends the history of the universe indefinitely into the past or not isn't going to be related to the BGV theorem. It's going to be related to whatever that new physics is. So just to conclude here, the BGV theorem does not in any way show that the universe, the totality of physical space-time reality and all of its contents must have an absolute beginning. It shows that a space-time with a minimum expansion rate cannot have the expanding phase extended indefinitely into the past.